Welcome everyone to uh, Columbus JS. Uh, this is uh, the formerly known as the Columbus JavaScript user group. Uh, my name is Guy Royce and um, yeah, we're gonna have our meeting here. Let me uh, change the view here and see if that, that actually took or not. There we go. So um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do the meeting here. Uh, normally we uh, meet every third Wednesday of the month. Uh, we do talks on JavaScript and JavaScript adjacent things. Uh, and uh, tonight we're doing a JavaScript adjacent talk. Uh, we've got Jenna Charlton um, coming in and she's gonna, um, she, she waved, but I don't know if she showed up on stream or not. Um, here, let me switch to gallery view and then she can wave and then you'll see her there in, in, in the top right corner. Uh, but yeah, she, um, and her talk is, what, what's your talk, Jenna? I, I Agile forgot the testing basics for non-testers. Agile testing basics for non-testers. So uh, this is something that everyone needs to know. Uh, hey, uh, you write software, uh, it might need tested. Uh, at the very least, uh, you, it's helpful to know how uh, the people you work with work. That's always valuable. It can make you uh, together a more effective team. So uh, that's what we got for tonight. Uh, once we're done here, uh, we'll, we'll hang out, chit chat, uh, talk about what's coming up next. Uh, but until then, um, it's all yours, Jenna. All right. Well, let me, oh, you know what? I need you to let me screen share. Oh yeah, we should probably uh, <laughs> like do stuff like that. Uh, so that I can blind everybody with my slides. There we go. You should Are we ready now. for this? Uh, okay. we're, ready, we're ready to rumble. My slides are as colorful as my hair. <laughs> well, it's getting a little faded, but you get the idea. <laughs> so, hi, um, I'm Jenna Charlton. This is Agile Testing Basics for Non-Testers. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am at She Russell's Test on Twitter. I apologize, the heat just came on because I am here in getting colder Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been testing for 10-ish years now. Um, and in December of this year, I made, or December of last year, that was 2019. Boy, this has been a long year. Um, <laughs> I made the transition from testing and, and test leadership full time to um, doing training and consulting and coaching and doing a lot of like, um, I don't want to say thought leadership because that sounds kind of, I don't know, I don't like the sound of it, but doing a little more IP creation and things like that. So I am now a training consultant for Coveros. Um, just got to throw out the small pitch there. We do. Um, we do agile transformations and uh, DevSecOps and DevSecOps transformations and DevOps transformations and coaching and mentoring and and um, agile development and all that good stuff. Um, I am a deacon at my church. I love pro wrestling, hence she wrestles test. I love punk rock. And my other big thing in technology besides testing is I'm really into web accessibility. So feel free to reach out to me about any, all, none of it whatever you want to do. And I apologize that we're not like face to face because of the situation. But if we were, I would give you one of those very shiny stickers that match my hair. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to open it up. Unfortunately, Twitch folks, I apologize that you're not able to get in on this. But to the, the folks in the room with me or the, the Zoom room with me, I want you to tell me what you would do if you encountered this login screen. What tests would you run? Basic login, uh, checking to basically see like validation on passwords and weird characters. Uh, let's see. Uh, so you would try maybe information and see if you still log. Try to log in. Stuff okay. Like so leave fields blank. Try um, unacceptable characters. I'd probably do happy path first with a, a a user ID and password that would be accepted, and then move from there to like whatever edge cases I could think of for trying to log in and probably unsuccessfully then logging in. Okay. Anybody else have something to try? Uh, I try really long usernames and passwords that uh, should blow oh. out the limit. I might try negative numbers because maybe it'll try and treat something as a number that it shouldn't. And that might be kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, if uh, there's just a couple things popping in my, my, my head. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like you meant like weird stuff. Like if this is actually, uh, you know, it goes across. It's like it's a worldwide application. You could put in characters from other languages and see if it could be processed. I don't know, or processed properly. 
Oh, and Katie said something good too. Um, uh, uh, sequel for sequel injection attacks. <laughs> yep, you can absolutely try that. Uh, I also think null and undefined and not a number and uh, what's what's the other one? Uh, nil would all be good options too. Mm -hmm. There's great stories about null <laughs> family. Um, okay, so I'm not going to say anything about the cases we came up with. Uh, we are going to revisit this idea at the end of the talk. Kind of see if your thoughts around this have changed. Not that your ideas right now are bad, but I want to see if you've kind of reconsidered a couple of things after we talk about testing a little bit. So I want to start by talking about kind of some myths around testing. Um, there's some controversy about this first one that testing is not checking. Manual testing is not checking. Yes, we do occasionally use a checklist, um, which is a very specific testing technique called an experience-based technique. But even when we use a checklist-based technique, we're not checking boxes. This is not a, okay, I checked login. Okay, I checked um, shopping cart. Testing is a much deeper behavior than just checking things. We are going further into examination. We're going further into interrogation of the application. And we're thinking about a whole lot more than just check whether it works. Because testing, when we talk about it from the manual perspective, really isn't just check whether it works. Now, when we talk about testing more from the automation perspective, that is a lot more of checking, um, mainly because computers don't reason the way people do. You know, software doesn't reason. We as testers, when we're using testing, testing thinking and testing mindset, we reason. And because of that, we really don't consider testing to be checking. Um, testing is also not a guarantee of bug-free software. In fact, there are seven testing principles. And one of them is that um, this idea of the absence of errors fallacy, that I can show you the presence of defects, but there is nothing I can do that will guarantee you the absence of them. Um, because there is always a defect. It exists somewhere because perfect software is a myth. And we know that. We know that with the exception of really trivial applications, there is no such thing as truly bug free. Um, and then the last thing that testing is not is we don't bug hunt anymore. Now, does this mean we don't do bug hunts? We do. We do absolutely look for defects. But this, the old days of um, purely testing um, only to find defects are long gone. We do much more than that. And in fact, where testers provide value the most isn't necessarily in the world of bug hunting anymore. It's doing a lot of other things. So if these are things that testing isn't, let's talk about what testing really is. Um, what testing is, it's not checking, it's exploration. And in fact, there's a, there's a testing technique called exploratory testing that's focused exclusively on the idea of exploring your application. Um, we provide more value when we think and we reason and we use judgment than we do when we simply check a box that something worked. Um, just like we can't guarantee you bug-free software, what testing is, is an approach towards good enough quality. Um, I mentioned that perfect software is a myth. Instead, what we're looking to do is get to a point where the software is agreed upon good enough. Um, we're going to, we're going to, dig more into that in a little bit. Um, testing is also advocacy. Um, and this is really where that great testing mindset and all of the reasoning that we can do as testers really starts to come in. Um, since we're no longer focused on just bug hunting, now we can focus on things like usability and accessibility and advocating for the needs of our customers and advocating for the needs of our business and doing things like reviews where we're engaged in looking at requirements and looking at user stories before they ever become, become code. Um, there is this belief that testers can't prevent defects, but we can. We prevent defects by being engaged at the earliest stages of developing our software. We prevent defects by working hand in hand with our developers and our business analysts and our product owners, thinking about what a requirement looks like, where there could be oversights and omissions and missteps and things that we need to address before we ever get them into the application. Um, and then the other thing that testing really is, is testing is about risk assessment and risk mitigation. 
we are the ones who are going to help create the plan for what if something goes wrong. And we're also the ones that are going to help you identify what's our riskiest parts of our application, what are our riskiest features and modules and functionality, and we're going to focus on those things so that we can mitigate them, understanding that there, there might be some defects other places, um, but we're, we've all agreed that we can deal with that risk because we, we've dealt with the biggest risks. And again, we're going to break all of this down in just a bit. So I want to go to all of you again. There is, sorry, it's getting warm already. There are many, many, many development languages out there. Lots of different ways to write software. How many different ways do you think we have to test? How many different test types and test techniques do you think are out there? Somebody uh, throw some numbers at me. I don't really know. <laughs> a couple, I don't know, a couple oh. dozen, I have no idea. Couple dozen, okay. Did somebody say eight? I said at least eight. Is... At least eight. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't know the answer to this. In fact, I have talked to my testing friends on Twitter and none of us really know the answer to this because there are so many different techniques and methodologies and ways to test that we would never be able to get to the end of the list. Um, and some of these Every tester you know has done. We've all done functional testing. We've probably all done some, some form of non-functional testing. Um, but there are some things that like, I've never touched. I've never done destructive testing. Um, it wasn't until recently that I did some mutation testing. Um, so there's all of these different ways to test and all of these different techniques expose different things about our applications. All of them tell us different things. And just like there is no developer that knows every language out there, there is no tester that knows how to do all of these different techniques because there's so many and they're so varied and they all tell us such different unique things. Um, some of these are manual techniques. Some of these are automated techniques. Some of them are a combination of both, um, but they all tell us really different things. All right. So let's get into kind of the nuts and bolts here about testing. And I'm going to tell you up front, I can't teach you how to test. No one can teach you how to test. Testing is something that you learn to do as you go. But what we, what I can teach you and what other people can teach you are the frameworks that you work in and the terminology and the techniques. But developing the instincts that it takes to test, that comes with doing it. So let's talk about some of the vocabulary, some of the language testers use. And some of this you're going to use as well. So I'm sure you all know about unit testing. You know, unit testing is our very um, most basic forms of tests that we do. These typically are written by the developer. And in fact, when I teach a class, I go even further and I say they are always written by the developer because I believe developers should write their own unit tests, especially because I am such a big advocate of TDD. Um, so folks at home, you should be writing your unit tests. You should always write your unit tests. <laughs> um, but we also know that unit tests um, are closely coupled to the code. We are focusing on the correctness of the code. This isn't really telling us whether our application is going to truly fit the needs of our users. This doesn't really tell us whether it is functionally correct. What it does tell us is if it's programmatically correct and if it meets our, our code quality requirements. Um, so that's our, that's our very most basic first level of testing. Then we get to this idea of functional tests. Um, and functional tests is something you probably heard before. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. Some people don't really know the difference between functional and non-functional. Functional tests are, are very straightforward tests that test our user stories and our requirements. Um, what's interesting about functional tests is that these are the what's. So when we do functional testing, this is the what our application should do. Um, it tells us how what it does, um, and it's either going to pass or it's going to fail. Um, so things like, can I check out an item? Yes, I can. That's a functional test. And then we have our non-functional tests. And people always think, oh, well, non-functional, that must be you know, things related to um, usability and things like that. And yes, usability is a non-functional, um, a form of non-functional testing. It's deeper than that. Non-functional testing tells us 
about our quality characteristics. This is how well our applications do things. So when we think about non-functionals and quality characteristics, we're looking at a spectrum. Load testing, performance testing, stress testing, um, security testing, usability, accessibility, reliability, maintainability, these are all non-functional types of testing. Um, they're on a spectrum as to how well our applications perform, how well they meet these quality characteristics. Um, Non-functional testing in some cases can be done manually. When we think about usability, accessibility, these are things that we typically do at least somewhat manually. There's some amount of um, automation around it. But the others like security, there's some manual security, but performance, load, stress, these are things that we typically automate. It's very, very hard to automate, or excuse me, to manually do performance testing. Um, you'd have to have potentially a thousand people ready to go, all working at the same time, <laughs> trying to run those tests. So instead, we're going to use JMeter or we're going to use Load Runner um, or any of those tools to help us do that kind of non functional testing. And then we've got smoke and sanity. And I'm going to tell you smoke sanity and even regression testing. People use these terms interchangeably, but they shouldn't. They're all very, very different things. So let's start with smoke testing. Smoke testing is kind of our most direct critical path through our applications. Um, it tests just the most critical functions. And I like to think about, um, when I think about smoke testing, if anybody has ever seen a, fire, um, a firefighter test a ventilation system, they hold up a flare to it and that flare releases smoke. And what they're looking to do is watch whether that smoke moves to the direct path out to oxygen, out of the building, out of the ventilation system. They're making sure that they can make it end to end. If that smoke doesn't make it all the way out, it means that there's a blockage in that system somewhere or that system is incomplete and it doesn't ever go all the way out to fresh air. Um, smoke testing is the exact same. We are taking the most direct path through our application. We typically automate smoke tests, and these are kind of our first line tests. These are the things that we do after a deployment to test or after a, a production to elevate. This is just going straight through for us. Then we've got this idea of sanity or confirmation tests. Sanity and confirmation are actually the same thing. You can use these terms interchangeably. Um, and these are tests that are only looking at our new or our changed functionality. When you as a developer fix a defect, a tester is going to go in and run a confirmation test to see if that defect is fixed. But all they're doing when they're doing a confirmation test or a sanity test is testing that change. They're not testing anything around it. All they're doing is that one thing. People often confuse smoke and sanity, um, but they're very, very different. Um, and, I, and I hope that slowly the world starts to realize that these are two different kinds of tests. And then the last one is regression test. And I'm sure you've all heard of regression before. Um, when, a, when somebody fixes a defect, tester goes in and tests that defect, they do a confirmation test. Then they do regression tests to test around those changes. What kind of after effect did that defect fix have on the rest of the application? What kind of effect did it have on all of the other things that what was just fixed touches? Um, that's when we tend to find a lot of defects is when somebody fixes one defect, we see the cascade down of a whole bunch more. And that's either because of something that was changed or because that defect was actually blocking a whole bunch of other defects that we didn't know were there yet. Once it was fixed, it was like, oh, we predicated a whole bunch of code on this bad assumption. Now we've got a roller coaster, uh, like a, a rolling ball down the hill that we have to, we have to kind of go and clean up. Um, regression testing is interesting because we don't just do it to look for changes around a defect. Um, we also do it to make sure that as we're elevating new code, as we're rolling new things out, that everything that we already discovered were working correctly continues to work correctly. I want to bridge for a second from vocabulary to kind of a personal preference, personal belief. In fact, it's more than personal belief. This is my ministry in, in software development. Take from this vocabulary an approach to testing that's a whole team approach to quality, which is developers writing unit tests doing TDD, 
automation engineers automating regression tests using either BDD or um, acceptance test driven development and manual testers doing really meaningful functional and non functional testing using really high quality manual techniques. That's how you get to quality is you take this vocabulary and you translate it to really putting a quality plan into action and using that as a strategy. All right, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> Speaking of things like BDD and ATDD and doing automation, I want to talk for a minute about the automation pyramid. And this is an interesting automation pyramid because it's got something extra at the top. You've, I'm sure you've seen this before. Everybody's seen this in some way, shape, or form before. I mentioned unit tests when we talked about vocabulary and how that's kind of the base of our, of our testing. Your unit test should be the biggest suite of tests you have. Um, that's partly because it gives us nice code coverage. Of course, knowing that code coverage, not truly a meaningful metric. It's important to have, but it's only important to have if your unit tests are quality unit tests. Because if you write unit tests that just auto pass, haven't really <laughs> made use of this nice big suite of tests down there. Then we move up a little bit and we get our component tests. Of course, component tests are kind of an extension of unit tests. This is, instead of looking at those smallest unit of code, now we're looking at um, slightly bigger units of code. We're looking at components instead of uh, individual units. And then we can move up to integration tests. We've got two types of integration tests. We've got our component integration tests where we see our components talk to each other. And we've got system integration where we have systems of systems being able to communicate with each other. Most common example are microsystems, excuse me, microservices, and those individual services talking to each other within a system. So that's a, a system of systems, of course. And then we move up a little bit further. Sorry, gonna lose my voice. <laughs> we move up a little bit further and we get up to our API tests. Um, API tests are a fantastic way to reduce the amount of front end tests you have. Um, and doing as much as you can through the API, you're gonna get a much, much, um, much, much faster suite of automation tests. It's gonna run much quicker. Um, in fact, you can probably cut it down by half and how long it takes for those tests to run. Um, so those are great. You know, you put them in between at the API layer, you get a really nice hardy suite of tests that are gonna run very quickly. And then we go up one more step and we get to our GUI tests. These are your Selenium tests, um, or you might be using, you know, some sort of tool you could use besides Selenium, you might be using like Testum or Mabel or Appla tools or any of those tools that are out there. That's your smallest suite of automation tests. Um, mainly because your GUI is going to change a lot. And every time your GUI changes, you've got to update those front end tests. Um, and that's, that's a huge amount of effort. And sometimes it's a huge amount of effort for not a lot of payoff. Um, so that's why I personally prefer API tests over front end tests. Sorry to all my friends who are deeply involved in front end automation. <laughs> um, I think your work is valuable. It's just not the approach that I would take. And then at the top, we've got this like cloud of manual tests. And I love having that up there because it's a reminder that all of these lower tests, everything in this pyramid is supported by that cloud at the top. And that cloud at the top supports all of those things at the bottom, moving all the way down. Because what we do is we use test-driven development to do our unit tests. We have, we have all of these different types of automation built towards regression testing. And then we fill in all of those gaps with our manual tests. We use really meaningful man manual tests to bridge the gaps, fill in the gaps, complete the holes, find all of our unexpecteds. We're gonna talk more about automation towards the end. So I want you to think about automation approaches and automation strategies and where there might be holes that we have to fill. Cause we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. All right, so making another transition here, because this is a very high level of what testing, testing really is. Um, testing is about risk. And I mentioned to you this idea of testers being really deeply engaged in this idea of risk mitigation. We make those decisions around risk 
using some factors. Um, typically, people use likelihood and impact. I like to add an, a third component there. Um, and actually, I give all credit to Progressive, who I used to work for, for introducing that third component to me because I that's the way they do it. And I think it's really, really valuable. So I like to add in complexity. When I think about complexity, I'm thinking about how difficult was this thing to build? Like this particular feature or functionality or module, how hard was it to build? How hard is it to maintain? How many other applications or components or modules does it touch? What's the cyclomatic complexity on it? All of that kind of stuff tells me whether this is risky because it's really difficult to work with. That is a huge risk because every time somebody goes in to touch it, we know that there's a chance something is going to go wrong. We know that there could potentially be um, missed um, conditions in testing when it gets out into production. Or we may have had to choose to scale back on testing because we needed to get it out. So we know the chances there that there could be conditions that are uncovered, that there could be defects that haven't been looked at. So I like to look at the component of complexity. I like to look at the component of likelihood. This is the probability that something's going to go wrong. Now, likelihood is difficult, right? Because if we have history on this feature or this module, then we have an idea of what the probability is that something's going to go wrong. But what if it's new? Well, we don't really know. All we know about it if it's new is what its complexity is. We know how hard it was to test. We know how many defects we found in testing, but what happens when it's in production? We don't necessarily know. So that's why I like complexity in there as well, because we don't always know or understand the probability. Um, that comes with time and with um, experience with that particular feature. And then the impact. And I know people hate hearing this, but impact ultimately is the voice of your customer. What happens to the user? when something goes wrong with this? What happens to the user when there's a defect? What happens to the application when there's a defect? Does it bring the whole app down? Does it cause a performance degradation? What happens to our brand when something goes wrong? Is it a recoverable brand hit? Biggest example is Boeing. Are people comfortable trusting Boeing again after that defect they had? You know, how much impact is there when something goes wrong? Um, so impact is huge. Um, and I don't normally tell this story, but I'm going to tell it because I have a minute. Um, I worked for a company in the telematics industry, and they had externally customer-facing APIs. And primarily what I did for them was API testing. And it was a really weird day. I happened to have a little bit of time. And I said, I'm going to do some exploratory API testing with Postman. I'm just going to poke around a little bit. I said, OK, cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this feature that on the front end you're blocked from doing. But I don't know if you're blocked from doing it in the API layer. So they had this ability to create lists of drivers. And there was um, what I did was I created a list of uh, drivers with a driver manager. We're going to call him John and a whole bunch of drivers underneath him. And then another list of drivers, and we're going to call the other manager Phil, the list of drivers underneath him. So what happens if I take John and put John in Phil's list? Um, now, on the front end, you couldn't do that. But on the back end, it worked. So now I had Phil with a bunch of drivers and John underneath him with a bunch of drivers. So, OK, cool. Well, I shouldn't be able to do that, but I can. And then I said, OK, well, what happens if I now take Phil and put John in Phil's list or put Phil in John's list? So now I've basically made them their own grandfathers. I said, okay, well, I shouldn't be able to do that. I shouldn't be able to nest a list within a list that kind of has its own parent, but cool. What happens if I try and pull that list back? So I tried it. And of course, like I created an endless loop. They couldn't figure out, the database couldn't figure out how to return this to the front end because they were their own parents. Um, and I brought down the test database. Now, what it turned out is I had uncovered a defect that had existed for multiple years that had caused a performance slowdown in the application for multiple years that no one had ever noticed. They knew the performance slowdown was there. They didn't know why it was happening. When we started digging into the production database, there were thousands of these abandoned, nested, like endless loop lists that people had created 
and couldn't return to the front end. So they abandoned them and then created another one. And then when they couldn't return it again, abandoned it. Um, so that's an impact. That was a defect that had an impact on the application for years that no one understood. Um, so that's kind of, when I say testing is about risk, yes, that was partly luck that I happened to choose to do this very strange test that day. But also the impact of that and the risk associated with it was pretty significant. And we didn't consider that enough when we were planning out our test strategy and our test approach and thinking about how risky business rules being applied and business logic being applied at all customer facing layers, how important that was. Um, I learned a big lesson from that. So I like to share it because other people hopefully learn lessons from it too. Now thinking about this idea of risk, um, let me get us back to the main topic of this slide. I like to score these and then that gives us our total risk. Um, because of course we think about risk in a spectrum. Some things are gonna be high, some things are gonna be low. I like to score these between one and five. Um, let's say that complexity was a five and impact was a five and likelihood was a two. What I would do is drop likelihood and multiply complexity by impact. And that would give me a total risk of 25. So it would actually be the highest risk because it would be five times five. Um, and that puts us on a scale of one to 25. It gives me a way to measure all of the risks against each other in a spectrum. I have a whole talk about that. I'm not gonna break it down too deeply, but if you wanna know more about it, hit me up on Twitter and we'll talk about it. What's important about risk is that risk is what gets us to good enough quality. And thinking about risk in relation to testing is what helps us get to this idea of done. Because we know that our goal is to get to done. We should have a team definition of done. Um, and that definition of done should be our finish line. So I love the Sheryl Sandberg quote that done is better, better than perfect. I love the idea that done is our finish line because a finish line can move. When we, move, when we look for perfect, we'll never actually achieve it. But hitting this point of done, we can change it as we need to. Um, <clears throat> so done is kind of something we can renegotiate as we move along. I like to think about the idea of training for a marathon. Now I'm gonna tell you, like, I don't run. And if I'm running, I'm sure a guy agrees with me. Like if I'm running, you should run too because <laughs> something is behind me that I don't want to catch me. Um, but because I don't run, you're not gonna go from me to a marathon the next day. But what I might be able to do is start training for a 5K. And that's my first finish line. That's my first definition of done is that 5K. And then when I hit that 5K, I can do a 10K. That's my next definition of done. That's my next finish line. And then I can keep going and I can do a half marathon and I can renegotiate to get to that marathon. But that doesn't necessarily mean I have to be done. Yes, I hit the goal, but I could keep going. I could do an Ironman. I could do a Spartan race. I could do an ultra marathon. Those are all new definitions of done that renegotiate based on what good enough quality is as we move through building our application. Because what good enough quality is for us at Sprint 10 is different than what good enough quality is for us at Sprint 20. We should be constantly redefining that definition of what's good enough and what's acceptable. And the level of risk is going to be what helps us to determine what good enough quality is and what that definition of done is. What that risk tolerance is, what kind of risk we can, we can accept. Um, this is our minimum viable product. This is what we're looking to deliver every sprint and risk helps us get there. All right, one more transition here. I wanna to talk to you about test techniques. Now I will tell you, I love thinking about and teaching and using test techniques, the, specifically the black box design test techniques. Um, these are what help us really drill down to the kinds of defects we need to expose. And really, I want you to, to keep in mind that these are techniques that you don't only use as a manual tester. You can use these techniques to help you design unit tests. You can use these techniques to help you design um, automated tests. You can use these techniques to work with your testers to build tests. So the first thing I wanna talk about is scripted testing. And this is the kind of testing that people think about when they think about what testers do. 
so scripted testing is driven by the test objective. We define our test objective as um, maybe testing the shopping cart or um, testing the login page. And our objective might be show that the login page works. Um, and that's a really big objective. Normally it would be more narrow than that, but we're gonna use something kind of general for now. Scripted testing is kind of like using step-by-step -step instructions. This is sort of like using a GPS to get us to where we're going. Cause this is gonna tell you step one, log in, step two, click on shopping cart, step three, do something else. Um, so it's very direct. It doesn't give us a whole lot of room for kind of the creative tested thing, testing kind of thinking. However, it's really important when we think about automation, it's really important for our most critical features. What we risk with scripted testing is what's called the pesticide paradox. This is another one of those testing principles. Um, the pesticide paradox is this belief that if we don't vary up our data sets, if we don't vary up the um, different um, users and values that we use in our testing, we risk eliminating all the defects related to the data we've used, but having a whole bunch of defects that we haven't touched because we, they're in other data and they're in other sets of conditions. It's kind of like treating half of your house for bugs and not treating the other half of your house. Well, yeah, you've killed all the bugs on one side, but they've either moved to the other side or you, know, you still have half a house of bugs that aren't dead yet. So it's that idea of like, you can, use, you can use the same thing over and over again and eliminate a whole bunch of defects, but still have a whole bunch out there waiting to be found. Compare scripted testing to exploratory testing, which some of you already heard me talking about a little bit. Exploratory testing is very different. Instead of using step-by-step -step directions, this is like using a treasure map. This is somebody saying to you, take five paces forward and start looking around because somewhere there's an X. It's somewhere near you. And you're gonna have to build that map and tell the story of that testing that you're doing as you do it. Um, so we use exploratory testing to help us identify things that are either difficult to find in scripted testing or they are um, maybe about exploring specific features or functions or identifying really weird defects that we can't seem to nail down. Exploratory testing is great for that. We tend to use a time box technique, which means we say I'm devoting X amount of time to this. Um, I don't like to do anything more than a two hour time box because I have ADD and um, two hours is probably the most I should dedicate to any task at any given time. Um, I break that time box into sessions. Um, if it was a two hour time box, I would probably break it into four 30 minute sessions. What's great about that is if I'm looking at say the login page, I can take four different approaches to testing that page, each in 30 minute increments. So I may spend 30 minutes doing security testing on it, and then 30 minutes doing usability testing on it, and then 30 minutes doing functional testing on it, just looking to see if I can find defects in leaving things blank and trying different experiments with the fields, and maybe another 30 minutes where I just start looking for edge cases. I just start playing around using things called heuristics. Um, and there are some fantastic heuristics out there. Uh, Lena Weibert, one of her favorites is Goldilocks. Too big, too small, just right. So too big for the field, too small for the field, just right for the field. Or um, Alex Schlabach. I always mispronounce her last name. I feel terrible about this. But Alex's favorite is poke it till it pops. And she has a whole blog post about it. But it's all about poking things. And how many times can you experiment with something before the field stops working? How many times can you experiment with a button before the button stops responding? Um, it's a really neat way to play with things. Um, Hillary Weaver Robb uh, talks about uh, Unicode Snowman and what happens when you put Unicode Snowman into fields. So I could spend a whole 30 minutes just trying all of these different heuristics that are out there and experimenting with those fields. What's great is you're not gonna do that with automation and you're certainly not gonna do that with scripted testing. The only way you can run these kind of experiments is through exploratory testing. We tend to use a very risk-focused approach when we do exploratory testing. We focus the greatest amount of time and the greatest amount of effort in what has the highest risk. 
And of course, everything we do in exploratory testing should be inviting exploration. Even the way we communicate what we found invites exploration. When I was a test lead, I never, ever, ever wanted my testers to respond to things on a charter with, it works or it doesn't work. I wanted to hear the story of what you did. I wanted to hear the story of your testing. I wanted to be able to go on an adventure with you. Um, and that because of that, nothing I ever put in a charter and nothing my testers ever put in a charter could be answered with yes or no. It always had to be, what happens when? Try and experiment. It was all about going on the adventure and telling the story and communicating the full experience of using something. And I could spend hours talking about exploratory testing, so I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> so let's talk about something that is a little bit more concrete. And these are some black box test techniques. Exploratory testing is an experience-based technique. It requires, um, it demands that you have knowledge and experience in either your domain or the domain of testing. These techniques don't require that. These are all about kind of using math or business rules to make decisions. So when we think about equivalence partitioning, this is where we are able to take literal equivalence partitions that we identify and use those to determine valids and invalids for our, our, our application, whatever we're looking to test, and make decisions about test cases based on that. When we think about equivalence partitions, we can do things like ranges, um, numeric ranges, or we can do discrete values, we can do booleans. Um, if I was to test an application for a vet's office and that vet only treats dogs, cats, and birds, my valid partition would be dog, cat, and bird as something that somebody could put into an entry field um, or an input field. Everything else would be invalid. So if somebody tried to register for their pig, that would be invalid. Um, so I would have a test case that covers one valid case and one invalid case. That would give me 100% coverage. Now, would you probably want to do more testing than that? Yeah, but that would be your minimum. Um, and then we have boundary value analysis, which actually extends equivalence partitioning. So equivalence partitioning, you can use um, discrete values. You can use, um, you can use other kinds of values. You can use ranges. Boundary value analysis is specifically for numerics. So we extend equivalence partitioning and we now have um, ranges of numbers and we're looking at the boundaries of those ranges. So if in your application you were giving discounts, let's say you got a discount for, um, no discount for zero to $100, 5% discount for 101 to $200, and then a 10% discount for $201 and greater, you would want to test on those boundaries. So you'd wanna test, well, what kind of discount do I get at $100? What kind of discount do I get at $101? What kind of discount do I get at 200, at 201? So instead of looking at the middle of the range or somewhere in the range, we're looking at those boundaries. Anybody wanna take a guess on the call right now, what kind of defect you might find using the boundary value analysis technique? That's what we in the industry call a fence post error. A fence post error. I haven't heard that before. It's another way of saying off by one errors. Yes, exactly. Uh, so a fence post is uh, if you're, you're counting the fence sections or you're counting the posts. Mm -hmm. You've got 10 sections, there's 11 posts. And so it's easy to make an off by one error there. So there's something else you find too, though. Okay, I'm stumped now. <laughs> than or equal, to, equal to. Less than or less than or equal to. Say that again. Uh, greater thans or less thans or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, which I guess is kind of an off by one, but I tend to think of off by ones more related to arrays. Yeah, I can buy that. Okay. Um, especially because when we think about black box techniques, the testers don't have a view into the code. So they're not going in and looking at the code and saying, oh, how did they symbol this? They're doing this exclusively from the front end. But when you think about it from the perspective of unit testing, you can write unit tests that do this as well. And that protects your um, all of your individual units of code from somebody making that kind of error. Because you're gonna catch it right away as soon as those unit tests are run. 
I think more developers need to use um, equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis when they write their unit tests. And quick shout out, I'm teaching these techniques tomorrow at Tiska on their on their virtual meetup. So you could actually learn how to use them if you log in tomorrow. Um, link to that on Twitter. I was gonna and, say the other one other than off by one that I've encountered is uh, uh, regional time date issues. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah you that's can, a good one. <laughs> you can find that too. You can also find rounding errors, thinking so, about um, about money when the IDE rounds for you. Is it rounding correctly? Because we need to find those. We need precision. And boundary value analysis gets us to precision. So I, I have to share something really quick. I, I hate to interrupt, but I'm going to totally oh. do it. Go ahead. Um, actually, two things pop in my head. But the thing that's funny is, is that uh, when I put your talk in uh, and generated the website, it was before daylight savings time. <laughs> so the start time for your talk on uh, uh, columbusjs.org is an hour early, so there's an off by one error. <laughs> <laughs> it is and I just no noticed it tonight because someone pointed it out. <laughs> 100% appropriate considering it's a test. <laughs> All right, so this last technique, this last technique is a little bit different. Um, decision tables are a way that we can break down complex business rules. What we do with decision tables, and it takes too long to teach it, which is why I don't like have examples in here. But what we do is we identify the individual business rules. We identify all of the potential inputs and all of the resulting actions for those inputs. Um, what's great about this is it helps us to identify all of the sets of conditions we need to create in our testing to potentially expose all of those defects. And what's extra cool is that we can take something like decision tables and combine it with boundary value analysis to help us identify the boundaries on those business rules. It's especially in, um, important if you are in an industry like insurance where ages matter, 16 to 25. We've got to test the business rule with 16. We got to test it with 25. 26 to 80. You know, we got to test it with 26, we've got to test it with 80. So we're able to take these techniques and combine them and use those to help us to get to higher levels of quality. And then if we use these to help us determine what to automate, we can now automate these kinds of tests, potentially build them into our unit tests and our automation suite and leave more time for our manual testers to do really meaningful exploratory testing to fill in all of those gaps. You didn't think you were going to get a lesson in, in uh, test strategy today, I bet. <laughs> so let's switch from white box. We've talked about exploratory, just one exploratory technique. We've talked about black box. Let's talk about white box. Now, you probably use these techniques every time you write a unit test. This is all about doing either statement or decision testing. Statement testing, we know if your decision has more than one, or excuse me, your statement has more than one decision outcome you're getting half coverage at most of that decision. Statement testing just tells us either the true path or the false path. Decision testing, on the other hand, tells us the true path, the false path, or if we're looking at like a case um, kind of decision, all of the different paths. I love teaching statement and decision coverage to testers because in many time, many cases, for folks who didn't get like a CS degree and most testers didn't, like most of us learned this on the job with some weird like theater degree or English degree that we all got. Um, this is the first time they really think about, <laughs> Matt's giving me a cheers to that. This is the first time they really think about how code really does things and how code really starts to actually behave. Um, I've talked to a lot of testers who are in their first couple of years of testing who have never seen code. They've never had a reason to look at it. And this is the first time they really get a chance to see, oh, when I am asked to choose yes or no, and I choose yes, this is what it does. And when I choose no, this is what it does. And here's how I expose that with tests. I'm not going to teach how to do statement and decision testing because you all know that already. As long as you're writing unit tests, you're doing this. Um, but it's important to remember, it's also important to remember that decision coverage is far more comprehensive than statement coverage. 
because um, statement coverage typically is only covering half at most. Also, we're running out of time <laughs> and I don't want to keep you here all night. So let me give you a couple more thoughts. Automation. I love automation. I'm not terribly good at it yet. I'm learning it. Um, but as much as I love automation, I also know that automation only tells us so much. So we want to automate our repetitive tasks. We want to automate things that we have to do over and over again. Let the computer do the mindless work. Let the testers do the meaningful work. We want to automate things that are really hard to test. If it requires the tester getting a harness and having a special setup and a special configuration, and we have to take down the test, um, the test environment for them to be able to set up everything they need, automate it. Like just make it easier. Even if it's something you don't test very often, if it takes a lot of work or it causes a lot of pain to test it, write a simple automated test for it. But here's the thing is that automation can't tell us everything. Automation tells us all of our unknowns that we know about. Automation will help us to expose all of the potential defects we know can be defects. But manual testing and your really meaningful, thoughtful manual testers are gonna tell you all of the unknowns that you don't know. This is gonna tell you all of the things that you had no idea you needed to look for. Um, so you wanna balance the known unknowns with automation and all of those unknown unknowns with your manual testers doing really good, thoughtful, meaningful testing. And hopefully developers doing some thoughtful, meaningful testing, maybe even doing it by pairing where developers spend some time with testers taking turns, testers doing some exploratory testing um, and maybe even helping a developer learn to do some exploratory testing. And then the developer writing some really cool unit tests and the tester helping or even with the developer's direction, writing the unit tests themselves. Yes, I said, I always want developers writing their unit tests, but I do think that if a tester and a developer are pairing, that that's okay. Let the tester write them with your support and, and spend some time learning from each other because testers always grow from learning, learning a little bit more code or seeing the code in action. Developers always learn from really seeing tests in action. So let's go back to, to this login screen. Do you think of anything new you might wanna look at? I'm trying to think here. <clears throat> Is there an API behind this? Probably. Okay, then I wanna test uh, how fast I can uh, try responses and keep mm -hmm. trying uh, by brute force uh, password. Okay, that's a good security test. There's things on this screen that nobody thought about. Think well, about the like the remember me, you wanna see if yeah. that works to remember the username. I'm not sure what to test with that, but I feel like there's, there's opportunities there. Oh yeah, um, well, let's see. Does the checkbox work? That's a good one, Katie. Um, so yeah, what does it click if we try and click in it? What about clicking that, logging in, coming back and seeing if it persists? Yep. What about trying it with a password manager? I can what tell you right now. Oh, what was that? I was gonna say, say the forgot question mark link right mm -hmm. there. That's one thing I've seen on other sites is if you click on that, and you've actually tried logging in with your credentials and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. When you click on the forget, it actually sometimes asks you to type in your username slash email address all over again, even though you kind of provided it earlier. Yeah. yeah. So how does that behave? Yes. I mean, are they testing if those are real? I mean, from a web perspective, are they real web elements or input elements, or are they is it something fancy that then? Mm -hmm. UI developer put in there that doesn't actually behave like a real button or a checkbox or a link or an input element. So and you know why that's so important? Yeah, I know, I know you do. Mm -hmm. Screen readers can't interact with things that aren't real. Yeah. Um, 
so there is a defect. Sorry, anybody who works for PNC, but there's a defect on PNC's mobile app. Mm -hmm. If you use a password manager, it will not persist. Remember me. Huh. There's all sorts of things we can do here. Now, is it really a big deal that pass that remember me doesn't persist? Maybe not, but is it certainly something that maybe we should look at? Yeah. Is it something that affects specific users? Absolutely. Our folks who use password manager, of course, care about that. Potentially folks who use autocomplete, maybe because they, they have an accessibility requirement around it, either because they use a screen reader or in the case of some of our more senior users, they may use it because it's hard for them to type on their phone. Um, they may have tremors, which means that they, they want to use autocomplete because it makes it easier for them to do that. Like all of these things, while it's not a huge critical issue, it shouldn't block your, your release. It's something we should think about. So like, I know, I feel like you all kind of had some new ideas coming to this. Like, oh yeah, you know, let's be advocates for our users. Let's think about, um, let's think about things that you may consider to be edge case but really fill a need for somebody. There's all sorts of fun things you can do with a login screen. Logins are one of my favorite things to test because you can really play with them. They're great for experimentation. They're really good for learning. So that's all I got for you. But I wanna know if anybody has any questions, anything you want me to expand on. I know we moved fast because it's a lot of stuff for an hour. Um. I gotta say nomenclature wise, that's the one thing I struggle with. I typically think of testing like the testing pyramid with, uh, excuse me, a unit testing at the bottom and integration mm -hmm. tests and the top you have the, um, the UI tests and manual tests, but your slide on the functional versus non-functional. And mm -hmm. I always struggle with those particulars compared to the, the test pyramid because they do, they do have um, I, I guess the, the, the different types of tests you talked about can be situated in different places in the pyramid, but I don't really think yeah. about that consciously very often. Yeah, they absolutely can. And we really should think about both our functional and non-functional at all test levels. Um, and we can do both functional and non-functional testing at pretty much every test level. Not all of them fit as well in certain places, um, but you can certainly build uh, performance tests into unit testing. And you absolutely would build performance into component integration and system integration. Um, we can build some basic functional tests into unit tests, not a lot of them, because functional tests usually require at least some amount of like end to end, um, but you can do some of it. Yeah, and that's, that's really where um, working closely with testers um, who really understand the idea of functionals and non-functionals. Um, the whole team can start to develop like this culture of quality, which is something I, I believe strongly in. This really isn't a question about your talk specifically. It's, it's uh, but where did you get your icons? Did you make those them yourself or did you uh, get them from someone? Oh, yes. the, on the slide deck? Yeah, in the slide deck. Did you okay. uh, make those yourself an illustrator or did you... Uh, find them at a wonderful site. <laughs> no, I use a tool called Canva. Okay. This is actually, this whole deck is a template that I modified. Okay. Yeah, Canva is super cool. Super, super cool. Um, really neat, quirky. I'll show you a couple of other decks that I built in there. Um, some very like professional stuff and then some really like goofy stuff that I love. <laughs> I'm always just curious how people put together their decks because uh, I put together a lot of decks myself. So like I said, it's not really about the, the topic. It's, it's more of a meta question. That's okay. I'll show you as soon as we stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think most agile teams are car are usually card driven, I think in most yeah. every case. And one thing to talk that I was, uh, I didn't see in your, 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 your conversation here is basically when you go through, I guess, formalities of starting a new, bit of work taking on a card as a, as a developer on the team, um, questioning basically testability of the card and the language there that's talking about it. 
Um, yeah, so I didn't really go too far into that because there's only so much time. But yeah. testability is something we should be thinking about as soon as we put a card into the backlog. Like the second we enter the concept in there, we should start thinking about testability. Every time we groom that card, we should continue to think about testability. And it should be something that we have an co ongoing conversation about in our, in our grooming sessions. Um, and really, if you're doing test-driven development and behavior-driven development as part of your strategy, testability becomes so second nature that you stop talking about it because it's just ingrained, um, especially if you use like gherkin and cucumber. You know, it just becomes part of your behavior. Um, but absolutely, like we should be thinking about testability at the earliest phases um, and continuing to have that conversation all the way through up until we pass a card. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I could oh. talk for days on reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a pain point with my teams. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not just from a testing standpoint, but just from a making sure cards are properly prepped for work. Not just from a testing, but yeah, testing is definitely a pain point too. And 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 I guess in my experience in my career so far, it's been pretty much lopsided. It's usually the, the testing pyramid is usually unit tests, and then there's UI tests, and almost nothing in between. Or if there's or if there's or if there's some middle tests, it's usually unintentional uh, tests where there's a leakage and causing essentially integration tests and stuff. Yeah, I've never the seen accidental the integration test. test yeah. yeah. Um. I, I call that the testing hourglass. Yeah, that's what I deal with. Yeah. It takes a it takes a real commitment to get to the point where you're really covering all of those levels. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just take a commitment from the team. It also takes a willingness to make that investment from your product owner. Um, and the product owner having enough respect for the tech side of things to be willing to take a little less points earned, like take a hit right. to velocity to build quality in. Um, there are studies um, that show that if we are more intentional about building quality in from the start, that yes, we may move a little bit slower to start with, but mm -hmm. we actually have such a higher level of quality moving through building the application that we save time in the end. Um, but of course, right. this, I mean, it's, it's basically um, fully embracing the XP concepts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it requires that, but it's really hard to sell that to a product owner and it's really hard to sell that to a business. And I know that, but because I'm on the consulting side, I get to advocate it for it all I want. Yeah. <laughs> and just hope people will listen. Um, I gotta say, I do appreciate that when you're about halfway through the talk, you had the conversation about um, basically, what was it perfect? Uh, was done is better than perfect, I think was the saying or yeah. some such, but basically like, you know, run a 5K, then a 10K, you know, basically just try to be better than where you are. Don't worry about basically going from zero to 100 immediately. Um, that's a that's something that's a mindset that's been helpful for me, definitely. Yeah, when I'm working on like a web, you know, website, you know, relatively risk is low, you know, until I get to a certain kind of point. But there are times when working on a website where if if something goes wrong, there's a high risk. You know, I'm affecting people's lives, um, and in that case, your definition of done has to be as close to perfect. So, like, say I'm if I'm test if I'm a test engineer at NASA, you know, or you know, I'm we're doing rocket science or doing embedded programming, there's a, you know, I your definition done kind of has to change to to be perfect. So one of the testing principles is that testing is context dependent. Now this this talk is predicated on your context not being safety critical. When we start talking about aerospace, medical devices, um, NASA, 
things like that, the context changes. You can still do agile, but we have a whole different level of what risk is and what's acceptable and what's not and what kind of risk tolerance we can take. Um, there are really specific techniques that help us in those safety critical situations. Um, things like um, condition coverage and uh, multi-condition decision coverage um, and exhaustive testing test techniques that we use to help us to really get to what's as close to perfect as is possible. Um, knowing that no matter what we do, we never will hit perfect. Like it's just not possible because somewhere in some condition, something something is wrong. Yeah, but those bases, we know very little, even though we know so much, we know, you know, probably know very little about traveling through space. Right. Well, in um, Boeing on the, the most recent issues, not just with the Dreamliner, but also the other issue, it took really, 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 really specific sets of conditions. And it had to be a very specific um, kind of avalanche of things to happen to create the conditions that cause the failures. And what's interesting is that those failures weren't even the most critical part of it. The most critical part of it was that they hadn't updated the pilot manual. So the pilots were supposed to be able to override the system and they couldn't because the pilot manual hadn't been updated to, to reflect the change to how they did that. Um, Boeing had to accept that perfection wasn't going to happen, but they were supposed to have a failover as a tolerance for when the on for when those particular sets of conditions could potentially happen. Um, and that goes into a whole nother part of testing that like I talk about in the ISTQB foundations class. Um, and actually I talk about it in pretty much every class I, I teach for ISTQB. Um, we talk about how Yes, we want to be low on documentation, but we want to do documentation that's meaningful and things like those user, user manuals that's meaningful. That's where we should be spending that energy. Um, so like when we get to those kinds of like highly critical, it's a whole nother conversation. It was with Boeing, with the situation with Boeing and the Max 737 Max, mm -hmm. it was really the communication like was just completely ignored, right? And, you know, that your testing engineers were doing it correctly and, and the engineers were doing it correctly and, and whatnot, right? There were a lot of um, a lot of issues. One of them had to do with like when um, the number of engine hours got to a certain point, the electrical system would shut off. That was one of their defects. And it, it had to be this like massively huge amount of like hours. Um, but then also they were, I don't wanna get sued. But from what I understand, they were cutting, um, they were rushing, essentially. And because they were rushing, they missed steps. And the FAA doesn't, their form of oversight allows the airlines to almost, or not airlines, that allows the manufacturers to kind of oversee themselves almost. Um, so that catch didn't even happen um, in the FAA audit. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff, but I also like, I'm only willing to say what I heard on NPR and not infer because <laughs> I don't know who's ever listening. I love it. It ties back to what you're talking about in your, in your talk about risk and risk analysis. Mm -hmm. And mitigation and what is and isn't acceptable. If you really want to learn about like great ways to do mitigation, Netflix is really doing it right. Um, that whole Simeon Army thing that they've got going in chaos engineering is really like where risk is moving. 